I voted to bring the students in from the north because I figured that uh, we tried to do everything we could and nothing was happening. And it turned out to be a success. And the success meant that is, and I always said that Mississippi would never be the same no matter what. Once it was opened up, everybody knew what was there and it would never be the same, which it hasn't been the same. The uh, rest would have come as a result of participating in demonstrations and marches. And we were not there to march. We were there to try and get people registered to vote. Uh, several of them were sent to Parchment Penitentiary, which is like 200 miles from there. And we were left with the responsibility of getting them out on bond. You would need a property owner from uh, Adams County signature, and you need a chief of police signature. And Chief of police made himself unavailable. One time I got so angry because uh, we knew that it was imperative that we get all the people out from Parchman and bring them back to Adams County. Uh, I asked uh, one of the police officers, where was the police chief? And they said, he's probably at the Holiday Inn. And that was out on the highway. So I got into a cab, went to the Holiday Inn, got out and had this man paged. And he didn't answer. I don't know what I would have done or what would have transpired if the two of us hadn't met there in Holiday Inn because Holiday Inn was very segregated. But that was a level of frustration that you would get to. Today I am uh, beginning to reflect a lot more as I've gotten older about my life and in the struggle and things that I confronted. But um, I wouldn't do anything differently this day because uh, what people such as myself and others did uh, help to bring about change, not only in Mississippi, but in the whole country, because it was a bigger movement that, that uh, sprouted from uh, Mississippi. I don't think I was born peaceful. I was born to rebel, I do believe, because I'm still doing it at my age. Good everything. Hey. Good everything. They say good everything. We ring our ring our bell for Dorian Ladner, June twenty eighth, nineteen forty two to April. I'm sorry, um, March the eleventh, two o two four. Went in at age eighty one on Monday. A force of nature, she remains. So, I say. I say. Um, thank you. Thank you. I didn't, uh, I didn't know Dory Latner, Mama Latner until, um, they did the, um, Megra Evers, um, series and, yes. uh, the actress that played her, she actually favors, um, <laughs> the, good casting, you know, and then you start talking about her and then she made transition recently. And there's so many people, you think about a young lady at 14, what were you doing at 14, Dr. Carr? I know I was not doing absolutely nothing. I was not sitting at the table <laughs> with Megger mm -hmm. Evers, that's for sure. No. 14 years old, she's having dinner, but not just having dinner with Megger Evers. She's rolling up her sleeves and getting busy at 14. Okay. At 14, she is involved in the liberation of black people. She couldn't vote Maybe, you know, she couldn't vote then, but, um, you know, you, you, you think about voting age 18. She's fighting for rights that she couldn't even mm -hmm. exercise at that point, right? Mm -hmm. And that, she was even 18 then, right? It was under the Nixon administration. It was 21 when she was coming along. When they lowered that in our lifetimes. Right. right. I mean, there's so many things that we just take for granted. That's right. So I just want to say thank you to you, but thank you to her, and thank you for... um making sure everyone knows who Dory Ladner is. Hey, we're just doing our part. Thank you. Thank, and thank you to the family, uh, her sister Joyce, of course, who many years on the faculty at Howard University and for over a year, the interim president, it was Joyce Ladner who gave Nelson Mandela the honorary degree that he received uh, from Howard when he first came. Um, these are forces, uh, her sisters and brothers, survivors, her daughter, Yovit, and her grandson, um, Yodit, rather, 
and her grandson. Um, and I just heard from Joni Eisenberg from WPFW. She said that uh, they're going to give her a, a brief tribute at the Image Awards, coming up, which is entirely appropriate, given the fact that if there's no NAACP in Mississippi, if it's not for them. And as you say, they were at the Elks Lodge that night. Uh, and Mega Evers, they ate dinner and Mega Evers uh, got in his car. They got in their cars. It's to see you tomorrow. And she said, I couldn't sleep that night. And so when they called me and said, Mega, Mega is dead. She said, I know. I mean, it was just that, you know, this is the terrorist state of Mississippi. So, yeah, absolutely. But, but even that, you, I mean, you, the, the who are her parents? Mm. You know, like, you know, there's something going on in that household that inspires everybody in it to get up and do something right and absolutely her parents were you know it's funny you asked that because she was a first-rate genealogist she had traced her family back to and through the plantation it's a very interesting family because there are as is the case with so many of us who were enslaved in this criminal enterprise a lot of white people in the family she traced the white people the indigenous people some of them were trying to be forced to be on the trail of tears and they end up in Mississippi from Alabama and North Carolina. She was a master genealogist and she talks about growing up in Hattiesburg and those black institutions and the interracial work. In fact, she talked about it. You know, um, there are a couple of well, a number of very good interviews. She and her sister did a long interview with the Library of Congress. Um, my friend Jocelyn Amani with the uh, SNCC veterans and the Black Power Chronicles. This is all this is available on YouTube. And then, of course, you already know that Larry Crow interviewed her for the History Makers. And that is my favorite of the interviews because because he knows enough. This is why he's he's our master interviewer. He knows enough history to continue. And they just basically having a conversation. But she talks about that genealogy. And at one point when they're talking about Mississippi and this is the human reality, we all know the laws are one thing, the social structure rules of conduct are, are one thing but the way people live their lives is something very different so you know there was a lot of quote unquote intimate interaction always with these racists who crave as the last poets would say you got some of the girls that yell black power black power in the daytime and white thighs ooh, white thighs at night anyway but uh in fact i just thought about that because gillen kane just passed from the white from, from the last poet but at one point, Larry and and, and uh, Mama Dory are talking and she talks about how these interracial relationships were living in Mississippi and always there. But you couldn't you had to pretend like you didn't know they were there, which is why she says the the open society opening up Mississippi would expose the hypocrisy of the country and the system. So you, know, Larry, you know, it was wild about that yesterday. Um, I had Rex Chapman on, you know, oh, yeah. our, our Kentucky. Uh, yes. buddy, and and he you know, he was dating a black woman. Uh, when he went to Kentucky, well, he was dating her in high school quietly. And then when he got to Kentucky, you know, he was talking about how the coach alcoholic and he had to mention that I'm not mad at it, uh, mm -hmm. brought him into the office and said, you know, we, you, you can't do this. And he was, he said, I, I'm embarrassed to say, I said, yes, sir. You know, and, um, his black girlfriend, he had, you know, black, uh, members on his team who would go on double dates so that he can date his girlfriend. I mean, it's, but this was in the eighties, not in the fifties or forties or oh, it's today. It's today. It's today. Right. And, and so while, while all of this was done in secret, what you're saying, they didn't want it to be out front. And because what would it say that, that black people are human they, and that black they, people and are human, and all of this is a lie. And, you yeah. know, we are, you know, we're keeping this uh, structure together for our power, not, for our pleasure because you know we're going to have our pleasure that's right wow. exactly and that's so funny you said because like say larry and and and, and dory are talking and then larry says well you know that old saying they say you can go as high as you want just don't get too close or you can be as close as you want just don't get too high in other words don't let people see and that's exactly right i mean the real the real punishment and threat of white supremacy of course is that it will show that white people are human Hmm. Which is a which is an ongoing debate in the governance formations of African people. I'm well aware of that. You know, the Nation of Islam. You know, some people say, "Well, they're not human. Mm -mm, not like we are." You mean individual whites? No, I'm talking about the concept and what it does to people. You and, and race traded the white. 
uh, activists who founded that journal in New England about 30 years ago. The, 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 sub, the subheader of that journal, Race Trader, was treason to whiteness is loyalty to humanity. In other words, you got to give up that whiteness. If you don't give up that whiteness, can we call you human? Because you have chosen this hierarchy over even your own desires. And we know with the with the billion trillion dollar porn industry that, yeah, when you, yeah, uh-huh. So now what happened to the social relations? No, we can't give that up. So you just can't give it up because it's a corrupt, funky system. And it, and it forces us to choose. You heard what she said. She said it was a line. She said, I couldn't wait to jump over that line. It wasn't because I was trying to get at white people. I'm trying to destroy the idea that there are people on this planet who are in a system that makes them think that they're better than other people on this planet. She lived her whole life to destroy that. I mean, imagine had that um, <laughs> police chief been available that night. Oh, she, she was Retty. 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 Always Retty. <laughs> Always, she. Uh, I forget who it was. It was Dory or whether um, whether it was uh, Larry or whether it was. I don't remember, but I've heard this story from her and from Dick Gregory. You know, she and Dick Gregory were very close. She she moved here to uh, D.C. in '74 with her then partner, her husband, an Ethiopian, an Ethiopian a national who was in grad school. He was writing his dissertation on, uh, I think, Guinea Bissau and the revolution in Guinea Bissau at that time. Amakar Cabral. And so they came and their daughter, very young, Yoda was very young. And I mentioned it because Dick Gregory, of course, who relocated to D.C., he and his wife and children. And they would talk about the fact that Dick Gregory one time, I forget where it was. I can't remember. But he said, you know, well, this lady right here po pointing at Dory. He said, Dory, every march I've ever been on. She been on that march with me. I ain't never been on march where I ain't see Dory Ladner. Now they've been all over the country, right? And then he said, "Oh, I remember now. It was the native. It was a Native American uh, march here in the early arts, no, maybe 08, 09. And and he said, "And here we are still, to the point that you raised being Retty, Retty, right? Retty." She said, uh, "Dick Gregory said, here we are still." Out in this hot ass sun, <laughs> he's still in this hot ass sun. Now here's somebody, mind you, Dick Gregory, who, as uh, Mama Dory tells Larry, when they were at the March on Washington in '63, which has its own history, as we know, in terms of what the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was trying to get accomplished in the speech that John Lewis gave, that they wrote, that SNCC wrote, that the uh, the Archbishop of D.C. Or, or Doyle with backing from the Kennedys try and force them to change and, and had A. Philip Randolph begging them to change this line where they said they're going to march through the South like Sherman to reconstruct this country. Uh, but they had to change that line. And so they were very angry about that, the SNCC folk. And Dory Ladner talks, <laughs> she's like, you know, I was there. And she said, I told Dick Gregory, I said, when Dr. King got up to speak, a man they called the Lord, not out of disrespect, but out of the fact that the young people in SNCC, and she talks about this, she says, you know, we were teenagers, as you say, we're in Mississippi as teenagers. I'm from Hattiesburg, my sister from Hattiesburg. We, but there were other people who were not from the area, like Bob Moses, who had come from New York, you know, Jim Foreman and all of them, you know, uh, Donna Moses, Donna Richards, uh, who we know now as Marimba Ani, you know, one, one of my Jegnas who's down there in Atlanta who was there. I mean, she comes out of New York. And then you have people from other parts of the South. John Lewis from Alabama. You know, you see uh, the great Marion Barry from Mississippi by way of Tennessee. But he grew up in Tennessee. So she said, you know, we're all down here. We're all in this struggle. We're teenagers. And these elders who are helping us. And, you know, I think about uh, We Will Shoot Back, Baba I. In Eli Umoja's book, I think, oh yeah, that nonviolent stuff will get you killed. Y'all can see I move stuff around a little bit in here. Yeah, I'm gonna leave it alone because I go over there and start pulling books off that shelf. Uh, this that nonviolent stuff will get you killed. Things we've talked about. These elders who were there, Amzi Moore, you know, his son is faithful new being in here right now, Professor Moore out of Chicago, Chicago State. Um, you know, they he said, she said, they kind of followed our lead backed us up, got in front of us on each side. 
Is it in part, you know, it's because in some ways the ancestors have been speaking this for a long time. The elders have been speaking this for a long time. We came into the, 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 the moment and they surrounded us and we were able to open up Mississippi and, and change the course of the United States of America in many ways. But as she's talking about it, with Larry and they're, and they're talking about that, that, that notion of always being there. She said, we were at the March on Washington in 1963 and Dory was at all this stuff. Atlantic City in 1964. She's very close with Fannie Lou Hamer, Miss Hamer. Um, all of these movements as, as they un, un, unfold. She knew uh, James Cheney and Michael Schwerner and, and Andrew Goodman, of course. And, and she talks about all of that. And then she would always, always had time, particularly for young people to just sit and talk, whether it be over at the Civil War uh, Museum, her, her comrade and our dear friend and brother Frank Smith, um, whether it would be at Sankofa, where she was all the time. I was over there uh, yesterday, day before yesterday with Heidi Garima, by Chom, who used to be chair of African studies at Howard. We were sitting around talking and they've put in a ramp um, for easier access for folk who can't just go up steps immediately. And, you know, Holly was like, you know, we one of the people we installed this for to make sure it was easier for them was Dory. And he said, you know, she never got a chance to use it. And you know how they sit there for a minute. And he says, by the way, happy, happy belated birthday, Haile Garima, uh, who's was the 6th of March. Uh, he said, you know, these warriors are going on. And, you know, hopefully they're all going on to fight for us on the other side as we honor them and lift them. Or do they know something we don't know? But at any rate, they're, um, uh, you know, we were talking about this and whether it be at any of those places or wherever you would see her in the bookstores. You know, I would go in a bookstore and I would see something and, and I see um, Dory. I said, oh, Dory, I saw something the other day. She said, oh, yeah, you was over at such and such bookstores. Said, yeah, yeah, I was over there. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. See, this is how you know book people because book people meet each other in the bookstores. That's how I know who's a book person and who's not. But. At any rate, the point is that uh, it's like, yeah, if I don't, if I don't see you in the bookstore. I, <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Um, because today is when to rebel and when to repair. Yes. Um, how do we choose? Mm -hmm. uh, she said, um, they killed Megger and he was peaceful. Yeah. I, I couldn't understand that. And she, you know, and it was like she couldn't get over it. Never. Because it Never. doesn't make any sense when you think about, you know, the violence that comes when you're being peaceful. It's That's almost right. as if the, the peace is violent to the violent. Oh, like yeah. the, the building and repairing and the loving and all of that is a is an assault and an attack on people. And it, it makes them want to be violent. I mean, King. Right. His whole platform was nonviolence. Right? right. At the point that uh, someone said they killed Jesus. <laughs> yes. Yes. Like. Make that make sense, but also, you know, what can we learn from that? You know, it is 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 it a nod that maybe the approach should be different at this point? Well, that's why we have the question, isn't it? When to rebel, when to repair, and how do we choose? We keep coming back to this theme, don't we? And we have to because um something that Baba I.J. Okoto used to say all the time, looking at a couple of his books, The Sankofa Movement, Nation Building. Baba I.J., himself a son of Mississippi. Um, I.J. Okoto used to say, if you don't do the work of your generation, it's not that the work is not going to be accomplished. You've just left it to your children and their children and their children. And of course, that is echoes of W.E.B. Du Bois in the suppression of the African slave trade to the United States of America, the first book that he published. His distaste at Harvard, the first book in the Harvard historical series where he says at the end of the book. That the correct time to right a moral wrong is when that wrong was committed, because if you don't, as long as you don't correct it, it will remain and it will reappear until you eventually have to confront it. And of course, he goes on to talk about, he says, no one would have looked on with more horror at the U.S. Civil War than those who started the country known as the United States of America, Madison and Jefferson and all those folks that um, Lynn Manuel Miranda creates a brown, creates a brown face minstrel narrative for. They're not to be endeared. They should have been confronted and ended. 
at least if not their projects, certainly their capacity to enslave other people. So sorry, brother. Even though I give him credit on the uh, Hamilton mixtape where he does have a song in there, which kind of talks about the fact that, you know, as they're debating the cost, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the constitution, uh, Madison raises and then Hamilton raises the prospect of pushing this question of ending the enslavement of Africans, pushing it and kicking it down past 1808. And he says, sir, you uh, talking to Jefferson, you, sir, who have hundreds of slaves whose, whose descendants will curse our names when they're, when we're safe in our graves. So you keep pushing it down. So the moral choice has to be made to end it. Otherwise, it's going to continue. So how to choose? We're, we're confronted with the same things we've been confronted before. And there are different theories on that. We're going to talk about some of those theories today. In fact, a couple of distinct theories. Dory Ladner's life is an example. And by the way, I should say, as we, as we continue, I thought about this as, as we opened up with her, that particularly as we started during COVID and we just passed, of course, the anniversary. I think it was Tuesday. Tuesday was the day the announcement was made to shut it down. Remember, we just passed it. Can you believe it's only been four years? Only four years. And of course, four years ago, this world was very different. And but Dory didn't miss us. Dory was in here every weekend. Dory, for years, would go on WPFW here in Washington, D.C., part of the Pacifica Network, and she would give commentary every Saturday morning. My dear friend and brother, our brother, the great DJ Lance Reynolds and his House of Soul and his uh, Saturday morning and afternoon radio show where he would play all the good old good ones and interview a lot of musicians and go through the funk era and the soul era. And then you'd hear the gospel. He'd have a gospel song because... Mama Dory would request whatever song she wanted to bring her in. And then he and her, she and he would have a conversation for a few minutes, 10, 15 minutes, sometime more in the middle of the show. Usually come on. She'd usually come on between like 11 and 30 and noon and she would talk, but she didn't miss us. She didn't miss us. Joni didn't miss us. Joni in here right now. I can tell you, Hey Joni, I know you were here because she then repeats a lot of what we've talked about and has conversation about through the week. Her show is on WPFW and we'll all be joining her tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on WPFW for a tribute to Dory Ladd. And she's very close with Mama Dory. She was at the hospital shortly before she made transition. And uh, so that's parenthetically. She was always, Mama Dory was always here with us. And that that is a testament to her feeling of and commitment to solidarity to those who would cross those lines, who would rebel. And so when to choose, when to rebel and when to repair, there's a form of rebellion that is a form of repair. Never forget that these people came out of black institutions. Dory Landon grew up in apartheid and certainly the social structure that has to be smashed. But she always made the point that she was raised in a black community, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, black school. She remembered all her teachers the principal, all the teachers she had from elementary school, from before school with her mother and her family, her father and her elders and her uncles and aunties and all who trained her and who, who raised her and her sister and, and everyone there. And is that foundation. That's why I love so much. I can get these, but we will shoot back because what AK talks about and what Charlie Cobb, her comrade, talks about in both We Will Shoot Back I can hear Lee Moja's book and that nonviolent stuff will get you killed. Charlie Cobb's book is how these black people knew how to survive apartheid, but they were also many of them very fearless. Vernon Damon, you know, think about him and think about all of the people who, you know, were attacked by the state. Mr. Damon blown up. You know, like Harry and Harriet Moore in, in Florida. Shout out to the puffer fish and all his punk ass people in Florida. We're going to roll all over you. And I'm going to talk. In fact, let me just pause there and, and say that, um, you know, Mama Dory would say, you know, they adopted a a a, 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 um, um, a, uh, a phrase from the anti-war movement because, you know, SNCC came out against the Vietnam War. And, you know, we've talked about that before. Um, when Ethel Miner, another comrade 
Dr. Mama Dory and, and, and her comrades made transition a couple of summers ago. We talked about how the SNCC newsletter, they came out against the Vietnam War. And then you see all the contributions of their friends began to dry up when they take on the Palestinian question in the 1960s. In 1967, SNCC comes out in support of the Palestinians. And then you see the money dry up. Shout out, by the way, to uh, the senior senator from New York, Chuck Schumer the highest ranking Jewish American in the federal government who came out this week and said the mass murderer BB Netanyahu should leave. And then Joe Biden came out in the last, I think 24 hours or so and said, yeah, I agree with Chuck Schumer as if y'all hadn't talked before Schumer got on the floor of the Senate and said what he said. Yeah. It's not going to save you Chuckster. BB got to go, but guess what else got to go The damn IDF and all of the mass murderers. You think building a pier off the coast and, Throwing food on a pier is somehow going to absolve you of the blood that is writhing on your hands. No, but, you know, back to the note, when they come out against what was going on in the region, this is after the Six Day War in 67, you know, SNCC money dries up even more. And, you know, Evel Miner brought that up. But this was also during the period of, as the editor of the SNCC newsletter, and we talked, as we said, we talked about that. You can go into archive and narrative and, and see the conversation we had about that at the time that she made transition to Ethel Minor. But I bring it up because this is part of the anti, anti-violence movement, the anti-global anti-war movement. And you see a phrase, you know, it's like, move on over. Oh, we're going to move on over you. Nick adopted that chant. Move over. But we're going to move on over you. And the whole idea of that is we're not going to sit back and just be peaceful in the face of violence that is attacking us. This was part of the tension, in fact, in SNCC around the concept of black power, which had been which was grounded, as Mama Doria always reminded us, not just in the Meredith March Against Fear. And. Willie Mukasa Ricks, shout out to our brother, the elder, Baba Mukasa, who is still there in Atlanta fighting the good fight. Uh, not just Mukasa Ricks, not just Stokely Carmichael or Kwame Ture, raising that in the Meredith, Meredith March Against Fear, the last great, say, call, the so called last great march of the civil rights movement. You know, again, these narratives really have to be rethought and not just by academics. In fact, not primarily by academics, should be by the people who live them. But the concept of black power predates that, as we talked about with the great Lerone Bennett, who goes back even a century before that to the 1860s. Black Power USA, his incredible book where he talks about the reconstruction governments and places like South Carolina and Mississippi. And we see black elected officials pushing for power. But even before that, the idea in the governance formation of who we are to each other means that we have always sought and acquired power, even under the most dire circumstances, which are still recent circumstances in the long arc of human experiences. Talking about the last couple of centuries in this criminal enterprise and settler colony turned state colony, United States of America. But Mama Dory always reminded us that the correct time to rebel is when you face oppression and that there's no incorrect time to rebel against oppression. Which is why Dick Gregory said, every time I'm out here in the street, I see Dory in the street. And here we are again with the indigenous people and this hot ass son in the street. And you think, well, when can these people retire? You can't retire. This is what got Bill Cosby in trouble. Whatever you think and don't think about Bill Cosby, whatever I think and don't think about Bill Cosby, the fact, the simple fact of the matter remains that at the 50th anniversary of the uh, winning of the case Brown versus Board of Education, right down the street here on U Street at the Lincoln Theater, in Washington, D.C., at a celebration moment, Bill Cosby stands up and he says, I'm standing up in here with all these people who fought with Brown and all the people who benefited as a result of being able to be the two Negroes that got in school after Brown. Have y'all want to look at it? He said, I'm looking at and I see Oliver Hill sitting here, the great Oliver Hill. I'm looking at his memoir as I think about it over here on this other bookshelf. Oliver Hill out of Virginia, Richmond, Virginia, who lived to be a century old. Oliver Hill, who argued with Spicewood Robinson and James Nabrit and Thurgood Marshall and that whole crew, Robert Carter, the cases that became Brown versus the Board of Education. Pause. Let me pause here and take a moment to not only remind everyone, but to take a moment of, of just joy 
This happened to me earlier this week on Tuesday. We were talking about Brown in my introduction to African States class at, at Howard. And I was talking about the cases that made up Brown, because, as you know, a couple of weeks ago, when I was in South Carolina, we were talking about Briggs versus Elliott, which in many ways is the centerpiece of the Brown strategy. That was the South Carolina case. And I mentioned Delaware and the case that was filed there by uh, Lewis Redding, the incredible black attorney out of Delaware, his son, Saunders Redding, the great scholar. But and as I mentioned it, I said, have any of y'all ever heard the name Lewis Redding? A hand went up, young lady. I said, you heard it? She said, I went to Lewis Redding Middle School. I said, you from Wilmington? She said, I'm from Wilmington. I said, did they tell y'all about Lewis Redding in school? She said, no. I said, this child went to a school with Lewis Redding's name on the building and they didn't tell about Lewis Redding. This is the work that we have to do. These were the women and men, Constance Baker Motley. You know, these are the women and men, Polly Murray. These are the women and men who who smashed Jim Crow, who smashed Jane Crow, who smashed apartheid. But that wasn't why we did it. We did it because we wanted to be human in the world. And this was preventing us. This is the logic of W. E. B. Du Bois. We didn't do it because we wanted to become funky ass Americans with this with this with this bloody striped flag with each star representing murder. Fifty murderous stars. And thirteen bloody stripes. No, no. The struggle was to create not a more perfect union, but a different society and a different world. And so anyway, back to the point. And of course, that's a, that was an example of us being able to get into some movement and memory to regain the momentum of memory so that a young sister who is now undergraduate student at Howard University could complete a cycle that began when she entered middle school in a building with the name of someone who they didn't tell her about. But she finally got the memo, but she shouldn't have to wait and it shouldn't even have to be that distance. But at any rate, thinking about those cases and thinking about the legacy of Brown and thinking about when it is right to correct a wrong and thinking about the guiding question, the framing question for the day, because as we have continued week after week and here we are in week 210. Of this element of the work, we have really begun now to raise weekly kind of many framing questions. And the framing question today is how do we choose when to rebel, when to repair? So Dory Ladner gives this, Larry asks her in his History Makers conversation that he had with her. And again, the History Makers database has been turned over to the Library of Congress. Shout out to Juliana Richardson and everybody at the History Makers, the founder of the History Makers, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, we were in Atlanta for the annual convening. It is an invaluable repository because you see people in conversation. And of course, the greatest of the interview is the guy who just keeps the history in his head and keeps pushing is the great Kwaku Larry Crow. Finalizing plans, by the way, we're all going to be together again in Wilberforce Memorial Day weekend for the Martin Delaney ritual. You know, Larry is, is finalizing stuff now. But but one of the final questions that all the history maker interview was asked, asked and that Larry asked uh, Mama Dory. What are your hopes for the black community? And here's what she said. She says, my hope is that every person, each and every person will be able to live a quality life. When I say quality life, I mean good food, good shelter, clothing, education. Those are basics for survival. That's what she says. Then she says, and that each child learn its history, each adult learn their history. Now, that sounds very close for everyone who we spent, for the thousands that spent each Monday night from December through a couple of weeks ago, reading, discussing, thinking with W.E.B. Du Bois in his series of speeches before Black college audiences gathered in the book, The Education of Black People, it should remind us all of the conversation he had with social science teachers and, and, and scholars at Johnson C. Smith University in the spring of 1960, shortly after the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee had been formed in North Carolina at Shaw. What Mama Dory said should be should be very reminiscent. It should put us in mind of what Du Bois said, where he says, my whole life I've been fighting for the elimination of discrimination, legal discrimination, the elimination of what we would call 
apartheid, legal apartheid, and then that would unblock the ability of African people to contribute to contemporary society in ways that are as impactful as our contributions to medieval and classical society. That is what Du Bois says. And in many ways, what Mama Dory says echoes very much. We're not changing the laws to disappear. That's what Du Bois said to those teachers that day. And, 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 and I'm going to be a little, uh, I'm going to push a little bit today because we are facing a system that, that, that is working desperately to have us forget that. Or as in the case with the young sister from Reading Junior, uh, Reading Middle School, who's now at Howard, to never have known it. Nobody's fighting to become you. We're fighting to destroy a system that would have us forget that we're all human in the world. And then having destroyed that funky ass system, that hierarchy, that ordinal classification to reach back into Jacob Carruthers 1972 essay, Science and Oppression, having destroyed and dismantled that system, be able then unblocked to make our unique human contributions so that we can move forward with the best that African people and everyone else on the planet has thought. That will allow us as a species to endure the best of what we have done, but it does no one any good to move into a monochrome conformity. Let's call it colorblind, except colorblind means white. A blinding whiteness that will leave us all dead. You understand? Because that system has enough dead ends in it to ensure our mutual destruction. Not by nuclear weapons, although that might happen, given the madness that that culture fomented. Oh, we can do this. So let's do it. And then I'm going to put it on you. What the hell? Where the hell did that come from? Come from your madness. We're going to cure you. Oh, we're going to cure you. Uh, then Larry asks, Mama Dory, the same question that he and all the other interviewers that the history makers ask everyone they interview. Whether it be Larry Crow, who has done over half the interviews of the thousands, which still boggles my mind how he could be one person could do thousands of interviews. He says, how would you like to be remembered? Dory Ladner says, as I said earlier, as a warrior, as a fighter for human rights, one who was very passionate, one who was devoted to making life better for mankind without respect to race. She said, I've always been for the person, the less fortunate and those who have less. And she absolutely was. So those of you, uh, not anybody here, but those who may be watching it, certainly those who are surveilling, welcome again, who would say, you're a communist, you're a socialist. Mm -hmm. Whatever the name is for everybody needs to be taken care of. Yeah, I'm that. And the question is, why aren't you? That really is the question. See, I don't feel that stick. And neither Dory Ladner, she said, you know, I've always been for the person, the less fortunate and those who have less. And also about teaching, she said, and she was about teaching. Uh, you see her at the convenings, the public convenings and the talks and the workshops of Teaching for Change of the Zen Project. Our sister Deb Minkhart and all of the folks around that, the teachers, the school teachers all around. The child in office hours, man, didn't realize that the principal of Roosevelt High School right down here, down the street, like the principal of Dunbar and all these sisters who are in the rotation in public schools and other schools around the country or in the Nubian nation. That just lifted my spirits. Man, I cannot wait to get down there and hang with, with those young people. But at any rate, Dory would be at those meetings of educators. And so when she says, you know, I'm about teaching and I want our people to learn their history, both white and black. Because the more I read, she said, the more I learn that we, none of us, really know our history. I'm going to pause there for a minute before I finish what she told Larry. To say that we've been at this now for, relatively speaking, seemed like a long time. Week after week after week after week after week. And then, you know, thanks to you, Karen, with the vision and, and putting the pieces together. And then all of us beginning to join and continue to join and numbers swell that we begin to continue to build out on the narrative platform in Nubia, where we can have these conversations and then think about what to do with the information and the exchange, the indelible importance of repetition and of continuing to return to themes has to be stressed. It's not enough to do something one time. It's not enough to do it, you know, 
to 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 take a, a, a context from another context and put it in this context. We hear Nas on the hip hop collaboration with KRS One and and, and Rakim, uh, classic. When uh, Nas says, "Oh, you went platinum? Yeah, that's nice. Now do it more times, three or four times, a couple of more times." In other words, it doesn't do you any good to do something once. In another song, I think it was on God's Son, I think the, tra uh, the, the album God's Son, or the, the release God's Son, I think it was Carry On Tradition when Nas says, you know, when you rise to your position, carry on tradition. When you rise to your position, go to war, don't petition, carry on tradition. In other words, people say, well, that's that's looking backwards, that's stultifying. That's what you, you know what? Silence. You should be quiet. Because every time you open your mouth, you're carrying on tradition. What do you think language is except the past? Grammar, vocabulary, syntax, morphology, phonology, the way you make sound. Mm, mm -hmm, mm, that's something that came before you that you learned and then you apply to your conditions. It's all tradition. I don't care where it's Terrence Ranger writing about tradition, whether it's a uh, Benedict Anderson writing about imagined communities. Let's, let's just set aside all that stuff and get down to the basics. Going back to the opening lines of Sundiata, when the jolly says, I am repeating what was given to me by my father, who was given to him by his father, who was given to him by his father. I must repeat the thing exactly as it was said, because we don't know what lying is. A jolly does not know what lying is. I'm repeating what my mother gave to me, what her mother gave to her, what her mother gave to her. When you hear Dory Ladner, you're hearing her say, and she never let anyone forget. I'm repeating what my elders gave to me, what Miss Hamer gave to me, what Vernon Damer gave to me, what Mega Everest and Early Everest gave to me. I am repeating what was given to them. My Theodore Roosevelt Howard in Mount Bayou, Mississippi. I was repeating what was given to them by the Africans who endured enslavement. And I was repeating what was given to them by those who were captured. And I was repeating what was given to them by those who lived their whole lives outside of captivity. And I was repeating what was given to them by those who lived their whole lives beyond captivity. I was repeating what was given to them by those who created the first societies in this world. It never ceases to amaze me when people say, you know, we are the wildest dreams of our ancestors. Really? Well, what was the wildest dream of their ancestors? Because you seem to start your ancestors on their knees naked with somebody with a whip on their back and you seem somehow to start it then, but did they not have ancestors too? How are you choosing when to start your ancestors? And I suspect you're choosing it because your master has linked all of your human memory to their experiences and not yours. You have the memory of a slave. You have the memory of the slave, which is why the behavior of a slave is how you move through the world. You must rebel against the memory of a slave because we were never slaves. We were captives in a system that tried to strip us of the momentum of our memory. And guess what? Don't you allow your ancestors because I promise you when you begin to study more deeply, you will recognize that somehow the memory of their ancestors was applied to their challenge in that moment. So when Dory Ladner breaks the back of Jane Crow in Mississippi, it's because she was trained by Africans who lived under that apartheid, but never forgot who they were and had nothing to do with no funky ass George Washington or no dream of the aspiration of the soul of America. That is a bold faced lie. Finally, Dory Ladner in answering that question, Larry Crow says, you know, the more I read, the more I learn that us, we, none of us really know our history, whether we're from Europe or Africa, she says, we don't really know the history. We only know what the history books have said. Uh oh. This from somebody who read every day of her life. Every time I see Dory with a book or talking about a book, putting a book in my hand, like her friend Hollis Watkins, Sankofa Man, memoir of Sankofa Man, her, her comrade who made transition not too long ago. She said, you got to get Hollis's book. I said, well, I'll get it. Thank you, Mama Dory. I didn't realize it was out. The last book we shared, uh, year before last, her birthday, they used to have birthday parties for her and uh, Andy Shalal and them had one over at uh, Bus Boys and Poets. Brother um, Andy Shalal, who confronted the mayor of Washington, D.C. last week about taking a stand on the slaughter of Palestinians after he wouldn't take her. Uh, she wouldn't take his calls. He just showed up at an event with a bunch of other people and they confronted her. But Andy had a, a convening 
uh, at one of the bus boys and poets, the one out here in Tacoma. And Mama Dory was feeling low under weather, couldn't make it, but I sent by one of her lieutenants back to the house, to her apartment, um, a copy of Doris Denby's book, her comrade Doris Denby. We talked about Doris Denby, who had recently made transition, the great culture keeper who was living for many years in Atlanta, uh, the photographer, uh, the collection, latest collection of her work. And I said, get this to Mama Dory. And if she's already got a copy, which she might, because she, she is a bibliophile, that'll be fine. She can just give it to somebody. Maybe you can give it to the grandbaby. I was glad, glad to do that. But the point is that that momentum of memory has to be there. And so she says, you know, we need to study more. And by doing that, finally, Mama Dory tells Larry, we will begin to understand each other and to share a common bond. You know, this is a sister who was through and through African. I mean, who could tell you about all the developments in the African world, in the Caribbean. I mean, you talk, I don't know that I knew a, and know a human being whose mind was sharper than Dory Ladner's and making connections and being aware of things, constantly reading, constantly thinking. I talked to Mama Dory, I said, I leave a conversation. Mama Dory, man, I said, I'm gonna call you one day next week and we, we can talk some more. She said, yeah, call me. She said, if I feel like talking, I'll pick up the phone. If I don't feel like talking, I ain't going to pick up the phone. I said, that's why we kindred spirits. That is why we are kindred spirits. Because, <laughs> you know, most of the time, I don't know where my phone is. And the ringer is never on. So I tell people, you got to text me because I don't even know. And if you call me, people, I called you. I don't, you know, I don't know where that phone was. I got a pair of earmuffs over here. I wear it in the house. It's quiet. But I still put on some. I, just, mm -mm, I don't need no noise. I'm trying to think. She was, she, man, Mama Dory said, you know. And sometimes she talked, sometimes she wouldn't talk. And I'm down for it all the time. The point is that because she was constantly studying, this woman who studied all the time. And when you listen to her and kind of be in conversation where you realize you're pulling things from all over the world. You don't respect these funky lines that have been drawn. But the place you came out of your mother's womb was Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And you lived in a black community where black people who understood black power understood it before there was a phrase called black power. There was a brother who wrote a book. Many of you all know the book. He gave a series of lectures and had notes that were turned into a book called Blueprint for Black Power. That would be Dr. Amos Wilson. Amos Wilson, who spent his life as a social scientist, social worker. Um, Amos Wilson from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Amos Wilson... The great Amos Wilson, black nationalist Amos Wilson. Amos Wilson was Dory Ladner's prom date in high school. <laughs> Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I'll never forget the time she told me that my mouth was hanging open like, what? I mean, see, people mistake black nationalism for white hatred. Ain't got a damn thing to do with white people. It's about black self-determination. Do you understand? And it trumps any loyalty to any particular country or state. It's very important that we have to understand that or not. And we could just continue to suffer, you see. But I'm raising all that in, in the framing question that we have for today, when to rebel, when to repair, how to choose. It's always time to choose repair. Repair, regaining that momentum of memory. It's always time to choose repair, regaining that momentum of memory. And that requires often in a place that wants to reduce your humanity, rebelling against those systems and those arrangements. So in listening to her, and to be in conversation with her, drawing from all over the world, you understand that the fidelity is to our common humanity. This is a sister who narratives will try to trap in the 1960s, trap her as, you know, Danny Lyon, her friend Danny Lyon, the photographer, white photographer, who she you see her hold up the book there in that snippet from the documentary they did on, on her that appeared, you know, at PBS. You see her with the American flag standing next to Donna Richards, Donna Moses, Marimba Ani, as she is known today, the author of Urugu. They were standing outside the 16th Street Baptist Church that day that Dr. King gave a eulogy for three of the four girls who were killed along with two boys in Birmingham in September 1963. This is after being at the March on Washington, where she said to Dick Gregory, she said uh, many years later, she said, you know, we was all at the march, but I was playing with your children. And then Dick Gregory says, yeah, and I was flirting with somebody back behind stage. I don't even remember. And she said, the only reason they brought up, they laughing. This is years later when they're in D.C. They said, we didn't know it was going to be all that. That's what, <laughs> that's what Dory told Larry. Said, we didn't know it was going to be all that, that dream. Yeah, I, I have a dream. 
we ain't really gonna be all that. It wouldn't have been all that except the social structure plucks that out. And years later, you got racists like Ronald Wilson Reagan, six six six. The letters in each of his names, Ronald Wilson Reagan. If you count them, that's all I mean. Is it all I mean? But the point is this: saying Dr. King believed uh, uh, that you should be judged by the content of your character, not the color of your skin. Hmm. If we judge you by the content of your character, you gonna fail every time. Forget your skin. You just ignorant. And a B-movie actor, to quote the great Gil Scott Heron, Bonzo Substantial, I think is what he called you. Bedtime for Bonzo, bedtime for Ronnie. But at any rate, stealing and then repurposing from Martin Luther King, who himself had gained that trope in cultural meaning making the dream from the great minister and thinker, theologian, Prathia Hall, Reverend Prathia Hall. A couple of new books out on Prathia Hall. They're in the other room moving so many books around here i'm dizzy but I, I cannot wait to get everything in one place which is you know one day in the offing but that that day will come but you know pray the hall who, who was uh, at a, a mass meeting i think it was georgia and dr king is there he spoke she spoke and she talks about having this dream having this dream she taking him to the airport after the meeting and he's like i love the way you did that framing on the dream I'm, I'm gonna borrow that from you did more than borrow it because the narrative now attributes it to him but the point is this you know, Mama Dory and, and Bobby D. Gregory, like, we know it's going to be all that. It wouldn't have been all that. But the narrative figures out a way in a social structure to pick out the things that will allow itself to replicate itself. And what looks like resistance, what looks like rebellion, what looks like protest. You can't let a system that oppresses you frame and dictate the terms by which you resist it. You can't let that happen. And people don't let it happen. This is what's going on with the armed militias in Haiti. The narrative is being framed and framed and framed again. I saw Lydia Paul Green in the New York Times this week writing an op-ed saying, you know, Haiti's at a crisis stage again and we got to let Haitians determine their future. This is the same Lydia Paul Green that uh, Randall Robinson roasted in his book, An Unbroken Agony on Haiti. Because he said, anytime you see Lydia Paul Green show up, I ain't trying to have no conversation because Lydia Paul Green worked for the New York Times and they got a narrative they running. And then reading, and, and, I, and when I opened the paper, it might have been Tuesday morning. I forget. I think I was on the way to class. I'm on the bus. I'm reading the paper. That's Lydia Paul Grant. I ain't reading this shit because I had Randall Robinson in my head. And I thought to myself, no, no, that's not a responsible thing. Let me read it. It was a, I won't say it was a different Lydia Paul Green, but it was a more uh, insistent Lydia Paul Green I'm used to writing because at one time Lydia Paul Green's beat was Haiti and you could count on Paul Green to take the U.S. side in some form. This is the narrative of the gangs and you know, barbecue Jimmy Cherizier down there, and here comes Guy Philippe from across the border from the Democrat, uh, from uh, the, the, the um, Dominican Republic with all the guns in the world. Ain't nobody manufacturing no guns on that island. And the biggest quote unquote gangs with the best arms are closest to the U.S. Embassy. Explain that. But at any rate, oh, something's got to be done. Uh huh. This crisis has reached a crisis stage, hasn't it? But the idea then that you can dictate the terms. The U.S. propped up Ariel Henry. We talked about that. We talked about it last week. We're going to continue to talk about it. And I'm just going to get a little dose of it now by way of this whole notion of how you dictate the terms of resistance. They propped him up. And now it's untenable. So now they want to put out the narrative. We're telling him to go. He's got to go. Yeah, because he's a problem now. Guy Philippe was y'all boy. Till y'all decided y'all didn't need him no more. Then you say he's a drug trafficker. Put him in jail. Oh, yeah. Some of us are us old enough to remember Manuel Noriega, who was also your boy, who went to jail screaming, George Bush gave me the money. Get your ass in jail. Shut up. You're the enemy now. Let's get started on Osama bin Laden. Come on now. But the point is this. Good guys and bad guys, as John Clark said, in some stories, it ain't no good guys. Why? Because we're talking about geopolitics. And the big criminals are the ones that can throw the rock and hide their hand. The ones that can wait on an opportunity to keep themselves in power. Today's FT weekend. See that? TikTok's revenues hit 16 billion in the United States. Now we know we could get into the argument of whether it's going to be a bill. I doubt that that bill is going to pass because they say it may get bogged down in the Senate as if that script ain't already, already been written. You got to get the white national something. But the thing that struck me in this is as potential acquirers circle, because now they're going to say, you got to sell it to an American company. Watch this. And uh, Prof, I heard you this uh, uh, past week talking about uh, that cabinet. Uh, is the, yeah, I think y'all were talking about the, the circus clown, the millionaire circus clown, Joe Rogan, and talking about who qualified, who not qualified. And you went person by person. It was so beautiful through the cabinet. 
Wilbur Old Man Ross shaking tin cans at people on TV and uh, Steve Mnuchin and all them. And of course, the littlest rebel, not Shirley Temple, Jeff Sessions, as you went through and went through that funky, uh, bu- uh, funky Trump cabinet. But here's the line that caught my eye this morning. As potential acquirers circled, former Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin said he was building a consortium to make a bid for the platform but did not provide financing details. See, what y'all gonna find out, what we should know already, is that criminals don't, they aren't the obvious people. Criminals are where they're actually very obvious if you're paying attention. These systems replicate themselves. And as ByteDance, the owning company of uh, TikTok, racked up $120 billion in global revenues in 2023, up about 40% from 2022, It says that they are poised to overtake Meta, Facebook's Meta, as the world's largest social media group by sales. Meta reported $135 billion in revenues last year, up 16% in 2022. What I'm trying to make is this. Mnuchin's a criminal. He got a a venture capital firm now in place. And that venture capital firm, now you just continue the crimes that you were doing in when you were uh, the secretary of the treasury and before that, when you was on wall street and as you roasted them beautifully, prof, you and your wife with their gloves on looking like Coretta, evil Levine or whatever her name is. And some cartoon characters at the treasury with, with, with sheets of dollar bills. And it, you, you, I mean, you was in the government side and the other side, we were all the same way on the government side after coming out of private industry side, except it's no real separation. And so we get caught up in rebelling and resisting that kind of thing, by the way, as as we watched my Midori this morning, that was from a PBS website. And you see the commercial that led into it. And this hadn't even thought about this. It was Carlisle. But some of us are old enough to remember the Carlisle group. Yeah, they're they're headquartered right over across the water here in Virginia. That's George Bush and them friends. Remember the Iraq war and Saddam Hussein? Remember the Carlisle group? That would be Dick Cheney. Anyway, these are the arms, these munitions people. If you yank on a gun in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, you know what's going to fall out? These people. Why are you arming both sides? But Mama Dory could walk you through all those geopolitics. But this narrative, this social structure narrative will freeze her in 1964. Will freeze her as part of the young people who descend upon Atlantic City at the 1964 Democratic Convention or who spend Freedom Summer there where she was one of the founders of the Council of Federated Organizations, COFO, which launched Freedom Summer. It will try to freeze Dory Ladner 60 years ago. It will try to freeze her. It won't allow you to talk about the family she made with an Ethiopian. It won't allow you. Her, her daughter doesn't fit well in that narrative. Their daughter, their grandson doesn't fit in there. The family doesn't fit in that narrative. The idea of connecting global events to local ways to resist doesn't fit well in that narrative. You got you to gotta wrap a red, white, and blue flag around her. In fact, the New York Times wrote an obituary. And I was looking for it in today's paper, but it's not in today's physical paper. It was only so far in the digital paper. Dory Ladner, unheralded civil rights heroine. Dies at 19, and dies at 81. I thought to myself, yeah, she is unheralded by you. First of all, even the concept of herald is a problem, but we could talk about that maybe during office hours. Well, I think that might be a problem, and I'm certainly not alone in that. Again, language is important, but she ain't unheralded by the people who knew her. She's not unheralded, uh, unheralded in the governance formation who we are to each other. Absolutely not. Is she underknown? Yes. And there are people today who may be hearing this name for the first time. Dory Mae Ladner out of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, but that's okay because you know it now. And you can make connections like that young lady sitting in class who went to a school named for a brother who helped kill Jim Crow in her home state of Delaware. She knows now. And if you want to bet money, you're going to bet money. She go home, she's going to find some people who knew Louis Redding. And then that opens up a whole new world. Probably some people in her bloodline family. But the point is this. You're not unheralded. She says, the movement was something I wanted to do. She told the Southern Quarterly in 2014, it was pulling at me, pulling at me. So I followed my conscience. Sam Roberts writes in the obituary in the New York Times, published on the 15th of March, meaning yesterday, which means it may not make the uh, or the print version until tomorrow or next week, if it ever makes the print version. We'll see. You're on the clock, NYT. 
Not that I care what you do, but I'm reading this here because, again, social structure narratives. How do we remember people? This woman lived an entire life of resistance from childhood all the way up to her last breath. And let's see how you try to keep her stuck in the 60s. Dorianne Ladner, a largely unsung heroine on the front lines of the 1960s civil rights movement in the South, a crusade that shamed the nation into abolishing some of the last vestiges of legal segregation. Shit, them the last vestiges? <laughs> so we must all be crazy in 2024, huh? Died on Monday in Washington. She was 81 goes on, gives the uh, uh, the cause of death, dies in the hospital from complications of COVID-19, bronchial obstruction and colitis, said her older sister and fellow civil rights activist, Joyce Ladner, who called her. Okay, Sam, you got to fix this, bruh. Dory was the big sister. I understand because she was unknown to you. Anyway, who called her lifelong defender of the underdog and the dispossessed. Born and raised in racially segregated Mississippi by a mother who taught her to take no guff, Ms. Ladner joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee as a teenager, left college three times to organize voter registration campaigns and promote integration, packed a gun on occasion as some of her prominent colleagues were shot or blown up, befriended the movement's most celebrated figures, and participated in virtually every major civil rights march of the decade. That's her life. You see that? You see that? These U.S. Mo Mm, I'll borrow from Gil Scott Heron. These Maryland farmers always want some of y'all above a certain age, certainly older than me, know that Maryland farmers was the word of choice in the 60s and 70s. When you want to say something else, shout out to Masharika Juwanza. Juwanza, she and her husband come out who continue to use that word. Anyway, uh, these Maryland farmers want to continue to freeze rebellion and resistance to the 1960s and then give themselves credit for listening one more time says what does it say here left college uh, packed a gun and participated in that no no the, the front the, i'm sorry the first paragraph a crusade that shamed the nation into abolishing some of the it's the last vestiges of legal segregation you done lost your damn mind how are you defining legal segregation sam we're talking about throwing people off the voter rolls by race and then claiming it ain't by race and John Boy Roberts, so you and your funky little ethics rules that you tried to release a couple of days ago, trying to throw the rock and hide your funky little downturn smile hand. Come on, bruh. But I ain't mad at you. I'm not mad at you, Sam, because you're not racist. You're just in a white supremacist system and you can't see. That's why you would say that Dory Ladner is unheralded. You understand? It's rare. I mean, it's, it's kind of sad, but it's cool. Ain't nobody tripping. Ain't nobody tripping because we don't rely on you for our knowledge. When to rebel. Well, we rebel right now. We rebel every Saturday. We rebel every day in Nubia and narrative. We rebel seven days a week. Here and I'm rebelling every day. In fact, I think there was a phrase that is widely bandied about that emerges out of that serious XM classroom. Yes, Karen's what? Rebels. We rebel all the time. Because we are forced to rebel. What did France finally say years ago? You know. I have to do this because you force me to do it. The system forces me to do it. You think I want to live my life trying to rebel? Like, what do you want, Dory? What do you want? I want every person to be able to live a quality life. When to rebel? All the time. When to repair? All the time. How do we choose? We calibrate what we do based on the circumstances and we find ourselves in. Hence, in our African studies framework, the absolutely unnegotiable Necessity to separate social structure, who we are to other people, like this obituary, to governance, who we are to each other. You can't do Africana studies by commingling those two because all that do, all that does is replicate the social structure. You're not in Africana studies if you are narrating your thing in this amorphous conglomerate that becomes basically a retreat to the mean of white supremacy. That is by definition not black studies, not Africana studies. So Think about this, then. We kind of, you know, think about wrapping some of this stuff up. When to choose, New York Times tomorrow will have in a print edition something that dropped on its website a couple of days ago. Actually, this dropped on the 13th, uh, 13th of this month, which was uh, the anniversary of the fourth anniversary of shutting down the country. It is the latest New York Times magazine essay uh, by my now colleague at Howard University, Nicole Hannah-Jones. And the essay is entitled The Colorblindness Trap. 
how a civil rights ideal got hijacked. And I'll just read you the first paragraph. Anthony K. Wuto, the provost of Howard University, was sitting at his desk last July when his phone rang. It was the new dean of the College of Medicine, and she was worried. She had received a letter from a conservative law group called the Liberty Justice Center. The letter warned that in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision striking down affirmative action in college admissions, the school must cease any practices or policies that included a racial component and said that it was notifying medical schools across the country that they must eliminate, quote, racial discrimination, end quote, in their admissions. If Howard refused to comply, the letter threatened the organization would sue. Wuto told the dean to send him the letter and not to respond until she heard back from him. Hanging up, he sat there for a moment still, and he picked up the phone and called the university's counsel. This could be a problem. I was having this conversation Wednesday night with my students in my critical race theory course at, at, the law, at Howard Law School. That was a hell of a session. Yeah, some of y'all in here, I appreciate y'all. Uh, we were talking about critical race theory as it applies to healthcare. And that opened up an entire conversation that I'm still just vibrating from. And I can't wait when we bring that uh, version of the critical race theory course. As I said, I'm just teaching it this semester. Uh, the person who usually teaches on sabbatical. So I pinch hit for them. But uh, we're going to do this course in Nubia to really dig deeper into critical race theory. I'm going to invite some folks in to be in conversation about this, but not so so theoretical and so academic that we lose the point of what critical race theory was about. But I think it was a fortuitous convergence of a couple of things. I'm going to talk about this in a minute. Some of you all who are medical doctors went through something that they call in medical education in the United States, match day. Y'all know that this week was match day. You know, in fact, that uh, yesterday was match day for medical students around the country. Match day is the day when medical students, graduates, in fact, of um, graduates of medical schools, match day is the day that they find out where they will continue their training as residents. You go to medical school for four years, you graduate, and then you go on to an institution to take the next step to become a licensed physician, pediatrician, you're going to be a surgeon, if you know whatever you're doing. You then have to go on down to your apprenticeship and then you pass your boards. You've been taking those kind of things all along and then ultimately you're then licensed and certified to practice medicine. But it takes a few more years. And the institutions who um, allow you to do that, they will decide, they rank their students at the school. Where would they rank? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let me, let me not besmirch this because I had to double and triple check it. You know, I had, I had to my, I rely on my medical experts, in this case, Dr. Reba Kelsey, who's at Morehouse School of Medicine. I watched much of their match day yesterday and then went back and watched Meharry in my hometown of Nashville, Tennessee. One of my, one of my favorite students, a daughter of mine, uh, Dr. Maggie, um, is from Maggie Ridge, who went to Howard undergrad, graduated from Meharry on, uh, from medical school and then went to Morehouse School of Medicine out there. after that and matched at Morehouse School of Medicine. She's out there now uh, in Ohio continuing her work. But I, I, I mentioned that because who we are to other people is different than who we are to each other. Match day looks different at white schools. I, I dropped in on the University of Pennsylvania me a medical school just to see a little contrast. Howard didn't stream its match day. I would have had to go up there and that's cool because I could see the other two which was, you know, great for me. I love the way Morehouse School of Medicine does it, by the way. I'll come back to that in a minute. But let me pause on Match Day for a minute. I'll come back to Match Day in the context of Nicole's essay. But she's writing about how these white nationalists, shout out to Ed Bloom and all the people who think somehow billion dollars can, can make you impose yourself on me. Good luck, baby. Good luck. Good luck. Go to hell. Not going to happen. The point is that y'all think this money going to make you run over. So it ain't enough to try to change the configuration of Harvard. Now you want to try to change the configuration of Howard and Morehouse and Charles Drew and Meharry. You think you're going to implode the law schools at Texas Southern. You're going to implode the law schools at North Carolina Central or Southern University. You're somehow going to invade the admissions process of Miles College Law in Birmingham. You think somehow you're going to get your funky white nationalist fingers on who picks who goes to graduate school at A&T. 
who trains to be a veterinarian at Tuskegee. Let's dance, let's dance, let's dance, let's dance, baby. Because we're going to enter your society until it gets to the guts and rip it out by the root, root and branch, as Charles Hamilton Houston and Thurgood Marshall would say, and toss it into the dustbin of history. Do you want to dance? You don't have any idea. Because just like the Chinese government is going to block a sale of TikTok and Steve B-list villain Mnuchin ain't never going to get his hands on it. Microsoft wouldn't comment when FT asked them because apparently they might be trying to get their hands on it too. Oracle was the group that TikTok's uh, parent company made the deal with before to say, we'll just keep all the U.S. data on your servers. And then, you know, the hillbilly horde in the federal legislature was like, there ain't no guarantee. It ain't no guarantee of nothing, hillbilly. Hill William, there is no guarantee of privacy. Your little hillbilly friends on the Supreme Court said there ain't no right to privacy in the penumbra of rights in the damn federal constitution. So if you want to blame somebody, blame yourself. We ain't got to rip down your throat and pull this out by the guts, root, and branch. You're doing a fine job of vomiting it up yourselves. At any rate, so Nicole starts with Tony Wuto, the provost of Howard, chief academic officer, concerned because the dean of the medical school has written and said, these White boys now sending us letters saying we can't use race over here. Wednesday night, I'm in the critical race theory class. We're talking about healthcare and black people and all of the things that beset us, all of the infant mortality and, and all of the, the, the diabetes. And, and, and we're having this conversation about healthcare and doctors and lack of access to healthcare, those who have it, who don't use it. And it was a fascinating conversation. One of our uh, students, the young brother who went to Morehouse undergrad, who's finishing up his third year at Howard Law. So you're both my parents are medical professionals. Dentists, another sister has two parents, both of whom went to nursing school, mother practicing nurse. Others had physicians in their families. And they talked about how their own family members who are medical professionals are wary of the healthcare system when it comes to black people. And one of them said, you know, I'm not so sure that we don't need to have a healthcare system that, that is set up so that even as we destroy the concepts of racism in terms of legal apartheid, we must cultivate black spaces where black doctors, black lawyers, black dentists, black social workers take care of black people and are trained in how to do that by introducing them culturally to groundings that create a deliberate way to interact with us. Oh, it sounds like Du Bois. It sounds like Zora Hurston. It sounds like so many. But the narrative will say, see, those people are racist. Hell, go there. Oh, hell, go. Go to hell. But of course, that's a dodge because as Curtis Mayfield said, if it's hell below, we all going to go. But what we're not going to do is get in this car you driving to hell. This is what Dory Ladd spent her life smashing. We're going to smash this car. And we got to build another car and make another highway. We're going to stop you from destroying all of us. So in thinking about that, the possibilities of Black people doing that kind of work, it echoes again Du Bois, who was saying this over and over again. This isn't self-segregation. This is setting us up to make a contribution that is as rich as the contributions we've always made to humanity. It's a very important point to make. And so in reading the essay and thinking about the conversation we were having on Wednesday night, it made me think about how we repair. We've discussed reparations many times, but we're not getting it because clearly, or we just choose to narrow the definition to the social structures we find ourselves in. And so, you know, reparations isn't just a material concept. It's first of all, a ways of knowing concept. It is a spiritual concept. It is a concept that deals with community. So I want to spend, a, a, the, as we kind of wrap up today, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on this in the context of Professor Hannah Jones's article. She makes an argument in this article that affirmative action was designed to alleviate the suffering and material conditions of people whose ancestors have been enslaved in the United States of America. U.S. affirmative action 
In other words, she goes back to the Freedmen's Bureau and she talks about, you know, how it was set up. And then she comes forward into the age of apartheid, what Carter Woodson would call the sequels of slavery. And then she gets to the 1960s and talks about the Johnson administration and how his brother coins the term affirmative action. And then Johnson runs with it, gives a speech at Howard. It's all very kind of standard high school textbook, African American history in the context of American history. Nothing wrong with it in a social structure context. In an African states context, of course, it fails on multiple points structurally. But that's not a critique. It's an observation because you got to understand what is the desired objective. And by the end of the essay, Nicole gets to desired objective. She says, you know, she says affirmative action is about the lineage. There's the word. There's the word. I heard the conversation y'all were having earlier around this question of ADOS gets keeps brought up. And I think about Yvette Carnell and them. Listen, I know y'all can come for me every day. We can dance till your feet fall off. The bottom line is, as Dory Ladner would say, the more you study, the more you realize none of us learn the history. And every time every one of us opens our mouths, our brains are on display. It's not the capacity of our brains. It's what we've developed to date. I will die an anti-nativist. My question is, why aren't you? And I think I understand. It's not a question of being uh, you know, accusing people of being evil or against, I mean, that kind of stuff we set inside. I'm talking about the well-meaning people who think this is the best way to go. We have to have this conversation. I would love to have it in Nubia narrative. We can come in Nubia, we can devote a couple of office hours. Bring the, I want to hear the ADOS position articulated by somebody who really knows what it is, not the Cajun of chaos. But somebody who really wants to understand as someone who is the descendant of someone who was descended of someone who went through that oppression, a captive who also had ancestors, it amazes me. You cut off the entirety of human history to go to the last two seconds of your experience and say, that's where my ancestors started. And then lie on those ancestors by acting as if somehow they forgot where they came from. It is, it is, it is, it is almost exquisite in its embrace of ignorance. But I'm gonna curb myself and finish what Nicole says. She says, you gotta alleviate the suffering. And here's the line, is lineage, right? She says, it's about the lineage of the only people in this country who have had that experience of 250 years of slavery and 100 years of racial apartheid. And it doesn't mean that we don't still have to address the marginalization of other groups or the anti-Blackness that Black people, no matter where they come from, face. But conjunction, junction, what's your function? <laughs> but, meaning we ain't dealing with that right now. She says, but. It also says that we have to address that curing the effects of a specific harm. I understand. Because see, when you want to die on that nativist hill, the critique pushback is, how are you going to just separate the suffering of African people out by which funky ass settler state they ended up in? And people say, well, you, you, we should be suing the United States. If you want other people to sue, they should sue England. Fool, where do you think the United States came from? England, France, Spain, Germany. You see, they form up like Voltron when it's time to roll on one of us. You know why they was trying to get the Kenyans, as we talked about last week, to lead a contingent to go into Haiti? Because the, 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 the core group, Brazil, Canada, France, they wouldn't do it. Lula and them wouldn't let them do it. Canada at first was like, we'll come. Then they was like, no, nah, we ain't coming. France is trying. They form like Voltron. Yo, miseducated community wants to cling to the flag where they came out their mama's womb like a child. It is a logic of children. You're not going to reduce African people to an entire race of children. Uh, let me not put that on children because the child out of Hattiesburg, Mississippi was a child and knew how to resist, like Dory Ladner. I ain't gonna put that on children. I'm gonna put that on miseducation. She ends the essay by saying that ultimately, even at Howard, there's gotta be, in fact, let me just do this. She says this, nothing illuminates, well, let me go back. She says, it's impossible to look at the realities of black life that these programs seek to address and come to the conclusion that the lawsuits are trying to make society more fair or just or free. Instead, they're foreclosing the very initiatives that could actually make it so. And nothing illuminates that more than a conservative law group's letter warning Howard, an institution so vaunted among black Americans that it's known as the Mecca, that its medical school must stop any admissions practices that are, have a racial component. 
Howard's Medical School, founded in 1868, remains one of just four historically black medical schools in the United States. Howard received nearly 9,000 medical school applicants for 130 open seats in 2023. And while almost all of the students who apply to Howard B. Howard undergraduates are black, footnote, not true. Well, yeah, who apply for sure, but the student body is diverse. Yeah, I know HBCUs are all black, right? All right, we continue. Because there are so few medical school slots available, most applicants to Howard's medical school are not. Since the school was founded to serve descendants of slavery with a mission to educate, quote, disadvantaged students for careers in medicine, end quote, however, most of the students admitted each year are black. That has now made it a target, even though black Americans account for only 5% of all U.S. doctors, an increase of just three percentage points in the 46 years since Thurgood Marshall's descent in Baki, which she writes about. Despite affirmative action at predominantly white schools, at least 70% of the black doctors and dentists in America attended an HBCU. HBCUs have produced half of the black lawyers, 40% of the black engineers, and a quarter of the black graduates in STEM fields, blah, 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 blah. We know those rules. But here's the thing. If you are arguing that reparations must be lineage-based, if you didn't, if you're not descended from Africans who were held captive in the death camps called enslavement, in the death system called enslavement, that you should not receive reparations and that Howard University and HBCUs generally were set up as a form of nominal reparations. I'm making a leap here, but not a great one. Then what, how are you going to disaggregate the Africans at an HBCU by who came through descended from those who were captive here and who didn't? This is where I would encourage everyone to read and reread if you haven't read it yet. And I think we might even have to do this a separate, do a separate thing, study conversation around Randy Matori's book, Stigma and Culture, which has a chapter on Howard. It's about what he calls last place anxiety. You put all these people of African descent in one institution like Howard Medical School. And then you have them fight it out over who's from the Caribbean, who's from the continent of Africa, who's from the United States and build resentments because nobody wants to be in last place, realizing that the system of white supremacy, of whiteness as a concept in the social structure has people worried about how close they can get to whiteness. And are the continental Africans closer and the African Caribbeans closer than the American Negroes, the Akata, as they might be called in Nigeria. I know I and uh, I, I and y'all know that in Nigeria, the whole word of Akata. My thing is I embrace the concept of Akata, except I say it's global. Akata, wild, no culture, no grounding. Well, guess what? Wherever you are in the globe, if you cut yourself off from the momentum of memory, you're a kata. The idea of calling Africans who, from the diaspora, particularly United States, or Yimbo, white. Be culturally, am I going to argue with y'all? Mm, I think you should probably look in the mirror because you still got that white wig on going to court. You still think that uh, flying out to London is better than going to the village. You still think that what you create is not really legitimate until white people recognize you. I know we got an NAACP image awards, but how much of those image awards are based on the blackface image of whiteness? Let's talk about it. Maybe Monday night in office hours. But the point is this, as I kind of bring this up, you write a whole piece. And again, this is the, this is the first piece that Nicole has put in that magazine since the 1619 Project. So I know that this is again about shaping narratives. At a newspaper that says that Dory Ladner, anybody know about her? The point is this: this is now going to spark this whole the whole trend. I see it with Sandy Darity and them. Y'all want to focus on this thing for lineage? There's a practical reason which falls apart, and then there's a conceptual reason that I'm really concerned about. The, the practical reason for all these people who think they're smarter than a legal system that ain't got no rules, a legal system that can say Fannie Willis can stay on the case, but you got to get rid of your one-time lover and allow Jenny Thomas's boy toy to still sit on the Supreme Court and never recuse himself for anything because he set himself up as a wholly owned subsidiary of white supremacy, Clarence Thomas. But at any rate, y'all think somehow there's some rules. There was a whole article in the New York Times a couple of days ago about the, the crisis at law schools teaching constitutional law because the students are pushing back like, how we learn this constitutional law? Don't seem to be no damn rules. But anyway, the people who are, are smarter than all of those people who will argue with me about the law, and I just let them argue. Really? All right, you that. All right, y'all don't argue with it. No problem. I, I have I, I welcome the debate and the argument, but you should probably know a little, just a, a little more about how the legal universe operates before you come and start lecturing people. Anytime somebody tell you something with absolute certainty, 
that's a person you should probably just listen to and then just kind of say, let me listen to a few more people because nobody, I know I don't speak with absolute certainty. I'm saying we have to open up these conversations. That's why frameworks are important to at least give us a point of common departure so we can have this conversation. Guided by, in the words of Mariba Kelsey, agreeing to agree. What is our objective? We're coming to the objective in a minute as I bring this in. The first reason people think lineage is going to work is they think it's a legal reason. See, it's not race, it's lineage. OK, so you're saying that when these people see that you want reparations to go to people with bloodline lineage as if you could get all them people proven. And we'll debate that. And I'm not going to get into that California Reparations Commission because we did a whole thing on that. And you can look in, in class on the one we talked about. We went through that report. You think they're not going to sue when they see oh, it's lineage. We can't do nothing about it. No, if you know the history of constitutional law in this country. You start talking about the the, the 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 Kentucky case and the Washington case, parents involved case. You start talking about any kind. Any time you see something that benefits people of African descent, it's not that it's barred by the Constitution, the so-called Civil War amendments, 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments. It's not barred by that. It is barred according to judicial interpretations of those amendments, and that's happened over the last 50 years. As Nicole does a pretty good job of kind of detailing in her article. The my point is this. You change the judges, you change the interpretation, you could get anything you want in terms of race-based remedy because the Constitution doesn't bar it. In fact, it supports it when you look at the legislative history of the 14th Amendment. But that is a fight for another day. That's the fight Kataji Brown Jackson and them seem like they kind of up for if they can just stay there. And that's why if you put the mummy back in with Kamala Harris, then you might be able to get a few more judges to nudge that in that direction. But if you if you put Donald Trump in, uh, Alito and Thomas will probably retire. They're going to put a 25 year old justice on there who believes that Jesus has come back any day now. And uh, that's going to be the end of this project. But, you know, let's all find out what's going to happen because if it's hell below, we're all going to go. So the lineage people think that if you argue for lineage, that's going to stop these white nationalists for doing what they've done in every case where that proxy has been used. In a different context, class, for example, with Anthony Kennedy and parents involved in the Louisville and Louisville, Seattle uh, desegregation cases, they said, well, let's use class. That's the way I can keep affirmative action alive a little longer. No, you know what they say then? No, class is a proxy for race. Do you understand they're going to say lineage is a proxy for race because the people who were enslaved in the United States of America were black? That is, unless it works to their benefit, because ask the indigenous people how many white people showed up after they found one indigenous ancestor and got them a check. You know how many white people are going to claim that their people were enslaved if that lineage thing... Anyway, again, that's the practical reason. That's debatable. We can have that conversation. There are arguments on all sides. In critical race theory, they would call it legal indeterminacy. There's a way to make an argument for all that. Fine. But one thing for sure, it's going to court. Another thing for sure, with this bench they got right now, they'll probably find lineage is a proxy for race. But we'll all see. That is, if any of this ever sees the light of day, because you saw through that California report, the legislature did not then act on the report. New York, I think I got a bit, little bit of help, uh, hope on that. I'm looking at Lurie, looking at L. Joy. I think we got some real conversations going to be had in New York that aren't the conversations that were had in California. It's going to be fascinating with the Reparations Commission in New York. You know, shout out to the governor of New York, who knows that the streets are safer than they were before, but still put the National Guard in the subway because you got to convince white people that we can be hard on immigrants and white and black people. Too. I understand. No problem. But the point is that that reparations commission that she put together that, she, you know, signed the legislation for. That's going to be an interesting conversation. And it's going to be necessary to push the reparations conversation. But lineage is the practical thing. I get it. But here's the problem for me anyway. It's the underlying sentiment. And it's found in the last paragraph of. Prop Jones's article. She says, those who believe in American democracy, who want equality, must no longer allow those who have undermined the idea of colorblindness to define the terms. Working toward racial justice is not just a moral thing to do, two boys, but it might also be the only means of preserving our democracy. Race-based race -based affirmative action has died. The fight for racial justice need not, it cannot. So that's your objective. It's not my objective. My objective is a better world. And that means in the local manifestations, better society. But that means in the local manifestation, you've got to grapple with the fact that in the social structure we live in, whiteness, white supremacy, white nationalism, and the nation state are the problem. The legal universe that clings to citizenship as the gold standard of humanity, that's what has us at each other's throats. Well, your people weren't enslaved here, so therefore we should get a special dispensation 
Okay, I'm not even going to really argue about that or not. What I'm trying to figure out is how you make a distinction between the black folk who get the screen. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not saying anti-blackness isn't there. Okay, so you know anti-blacks is part of the underlying problem. And that compensation, as you're defining it in a material sense, and then you get sloppy with it because there's something underneath that you love. You love your master. So we're not just talking about a check. We're not just talking about loans. We're not just talking about access to institutions. We're talking about an idea. Those who believe in American democracy, I don't believe in American democracy. I believe in humanity. And you think that American democracy is the gold standard? Yes, because you're linking it to concept of where you came out of your mother's womb gives you an elevated membership in a society. We're not getting rid of citizenship anytime soon, but please understand that that is a recent concept and that it comes as part of the suite of assault of violences that we call the modern world system, and that it now is loosed from even racial categorization. So you got people saying whether they're immigrant or not in South Africa or Nigeria. You got people saying whether they're immigrant or not in Haiti or the Dominican Republic. You got people saying whether they're immigrant or not in Mexico or Guatemala. You got people saying whether they're immigrant or not in London and Paris. This whole concept of humanity linked to a field of violence in a legal system that diminishes or elevates your humanity based on where you came out of your mother's womb is a problem. And you can begin to address it in a place called the United States by saying, we're going to make sure that everybody in Dory Ladner's construct, everybody has health care. Everybody has, you know, don't put the immigrants against the other people in Chicago or New York. I understand the violences, but understand that those violences allow the Steve Mnuchins of the world and the Jeff Bezos of the world and the Elon Musks of the world to get away scot-free what they're doing, which is fomenting the tensions. We've got to think differently yesterday. Yesterday was Match Day. I watch Match Day. It is hella inspiring. Y'all go on uh, YouTube and look at Meharry Match Day and look at Morehouse School of Medicine Match Day. I like Morehouse School of Medicine's Match Day for this reason. I'll tell y'all why. Any Match Day in the country yesterday, you bring all the medical students together who are graduating. It's graduation season coming up. And they get envelopes. And so then... They open the envelopes and in the envelope, they rank their top six schools. I want to go to this school. I want to go to Berkeley. I want to go to Morehouse School of Medicine. I want to go to uh, Meharry. I want to go to Howard. I want to go to NYU Medical School. And then you one, two, three, four, five, six. These are my six top choices. Rank one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, the students do that. Each student who's a medical student who's graduating with their MD. The schools then rank the students. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. An algorithm, to make it fair, this only happened since the 50s, since the 1952. The algorithm, because then, before then, Harvard, Stanford, whatever, they would reach down into the medical schools around the country and decide which students they want and invite them, sometimes after their second year of medical school, trying to get snatch up the best students. Then they put in an algorithm and say, no, you students rank your six, the schools will rank their six, and then you see who matches where. The preference is given to the students. I had to have Reba Kelsey walk me through this. Reba, tell me again. Because I explain this to me. Okay, okay, yeah. Because because I watch it every year. Oh, my God. You cannot be a cynic when you watch Match Day. So if you look at Meharry's, for example, they're in the, they're in the audi auditorium, and the lady stands up and says, okay, y'all ready? Everybody got their envelope? Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7. You see people out there with their envelope. One, they open them up. Ah, this is where I'm going. This is where I'm going. And then they have them one by one come to the podium and announce where they're going. It's a beautiful moment. I like Morehouse School of Medicines for this reason. This is what Morehouse does. They don't have that countdown. Everybody rip it open. That's what they did at Penn, too. I watched Penn. They ripped it open. Ah, hugging this kind of thing. One by one, the students at Morehouse come to the podium, and they don't come alone. Medical students with their mama, their daddy, their siblings, their friends come to the podium. Just before they speak, you see their name and pictures of them. Baby picture, teenagers, sometimes at work, school, whatever, in class with their, you know, families. And then they say, I want to thank my mama. I want to thank my cousin. I mean, it's beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful. And then they open the envelope. I will be continuing my graduate education, my, my residency at Stanford, Emory. Morehouse School of Medicine, Meharry, Howard. 
and everybody cheers. Now, many of them will say, here's the envelope. I'm going to let my mama do it. I'm going to let my father do it. And they come to the, we want to thank you all. You know, black people, ways of knowing. I want to thank God. Then they open the envelope. This way they going. Everybody cheers. But the thing about it is, and this is for my colleague, Nicole Anna Jones, and everybody else that thinks lineage should be at the front of our justice struggle. When you see and listen, those names of African people are from all over the African world. Africans who came, a couple of Negroes yesterday, Morehouse School of Medicine. These some Mississippi Negroes. Somebody, young brother went to Tougaloo undergrad. Mama standing there with him, just as thick uh, an ebo, a Mississippi Ebonics as you have. Went to Morehouse School of Medicine. And now my son is going to, I think it was Emory. Everybody cheering. Then you got the students who came from Nigeria. The Igbo and the Yoruba and the Bibio and all. Now, some of these students started there, came here. Many of them are second or third generations. You're going to yank them out of school because they're not lineage Africans? Stop playing. Then you got the Clarks and the Fredericks, you know, the, the names that, if you know the British lineage, these are the Negroes from the Caribbean. From Jamaica and Trinidad, from Barbados, and they come at one, and they come to the stage, and you hear the lilt of the Africans of the Caribbean in their voice, and they mama is up there, and they daddy is up there, and they open their envelope, but they mama open their envelope, and you say, "This is what it's supposed to be, friends. This is why Dory Ladner from Mississippi, Hasbury, Mississippi, her partner from Ethiopia. Now, what you gonna do with Yoda? She born here in the United States. Her daddy from Ethiopia. She don't get no check, huh?" You got to put her out to HBCU, huh? Stop playing with the lives of African people by the rules designed by your enemy. But I understand because you love your master, those who believe in American democracy. Ah, what did Ella Joe Baker say? We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes, until the killing of black men, black mother's son. Is, in, is as important as the killing of white men, white mother's son, not white descendants of slave sons. Friends, I'm going to end now because we got a lot to think about. When we say repair, what do we mean? We don't mean just resistance and rebellion. You cannot define yourself by opposing something. Who are you to each other? What this journey of 210 Saturdays and hand County has reminded me of, and I think what it should remind us all of, is that once is not enough, that multiple times are not enough, that the only way that we change is through re perpetual repeat, perpetual intergenerational repeat, perpetual study and action. It doesn't sink in any other way. On the 16th of March, 316, for God so loved the world. <laughs> Sacrifice, in other words. This is what Du Bois was talking about. I don't know how you landed on 316. I don't know <laughs> how you did that. Sacrifice, that's all. <laughs> Sacrifice. Um, you know, every Saturday, I'm tasked with sitting in community with you, um, taking notes, thinking more deeply, but the thought process happens afterwards. Like I have to go for a walk and let it you know, ruminate, pick up one of the 50 books that you usually hold up. Mm -hmm. uh, I downloaded the book on slowing down last week and started uh, my walk with that, with that book. Um, I forgot the title of it. I just know uh, it was, it was in line with Stolen Focus, which is another book I got from you, which was transformative. <laughs> Let me yeah. think, you know, like there, there are so many nuggets of, of, um, pathways that we can go down, you know, in these classes. Yes. Never about the class, really. It's about us and what mm -hmm. we get from it. But if we spend so much time looking to be offended or looking to yeah. put in the argument or looking to, you know, uh offer up our opinion, we we miss we miss the deep work that we need to do on ourselves, mm -hmm. which is required for us to even have the liberation mm -hmm. that we're talking about. You know, it starts with you. So um I'm gonna go go for a walk and sit with all of this and and remember um, our sister. I'm I'm gonna sit with that because uh, you know. I was you just know what's funny? You see her face there. 
she loves smiling, but she always had that hard rock look. So if she, I love how the filmmakers did this because if you didn't see it to the end, and she couldn't help it. She could. I know what it was. You, we're gonna watch you. Just keep walking, and then she busted out in a smile because that's her spirit. But she will fight you, and if you miss it, they will freeze her without that smile on her face. So I'm so glad. <laughs> And at the New York Times, which is one of the uh, few newspapers that still values the art of the obituary, which again, I, you know, we went through having that conversation about why I always assign that to my class to, yes. put, to write their own obituary, why that is a very important and powerful, it's not a throwaway. It, some of the best writers in the world write obituaries because it is part historian, part storyteller, part like all of the craft of journalism goes into the obituary. And for them to get it wrong tells you a little bit about the decline of of these um, institutions, especially me. Would you say they got it wrong? I mean, Sam, Sam Roberts is one of the most accomplished to the point. That's you're what ready. I'm saying. Like, are you lazy? Are you are you are you tired? Oh, that's your mindset. In other words, she does disappear. I mean, we all disappear after I have a dream or after the Civil Rights Act, about the Voting Rights Act. Right. Nothing happens since then. Right. I mean, I, I mean. How do you explain you? How do you explain me? They don't even remember the stories you covered at the Daily News. I don't remember them. <laughs> so no, you remember you remember them the minute you say Abner Luima, the minute you say uh, I'm going to do Diallo. I mean, you know, Eleanor Bumpers. It, it, we talk about it here. You pick it up like you just wrote the story. This is the challenge. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Oh. Yeah. Now, the fight, I mean, you know, um, every day, which is why I battle so hard, like I don't want us to forget because I know that it is just, we're just a generation away from it all going away. That's right. For real, for real. Like for real, for in real. an era, which is wild, right? So they're about to get rid of TikTok or sell it, or I don't know what the underlying message is because China has access to our information as if they don't have access to our information, as if they don't already have access to our information. Like it, it's 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 such a, a crazy place that we are in where we have access to everything at the flip of a switch at the at, at your fingertip, but we know nothing. We know nothing. We we have no institutional deep tertiary knowledge about anything. Everything mm. is and all of the people that we gather knowledge from, which is why I cannot ever stop doing in class with car with you because mm. I need to remember. Mm. We and, all need to remember, bro. And we're, we're challenging and pushing each other to go That's deeper because there's more to know. And like you said, we can't just start here. We got to go back because in those remembrances, I learned that Socrates learned from Africans. I learned that Pythagoras <laughs> learned from Africans. Yes, everything that we've been taught in our school system started in, on that continent. And I got to, you know, we we had a conversation yesterday about Bid Whist. How about that? And this brother came and he wrote a book about Bid Whist, and he took it back to Europe with the game Whist, sure. and then how black people brought their African ways of knowing to an, a European game. Yes. which brings in strategy and everything. And that game's about to be lost because, it's, you know, people to spades is easy, you know, but we <laughs> just require something. So it's not just sitting around the table in community, but it's, it's, there's a chess like thought process and a poker like guile. And it's all of those elements brought in. And I learned that the seat, you know, uh, at some of the best players, you know, as a young person. And so it's, it's sad to me that so much is being lost. So we have, and why you at Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise made sure we all had our set so that when we think about these subsequent card games, we can look at the foundation of the thinking games that those games that influence. Right. Absolutely. You may. And that's how we do it. That's the momentum of memory. That's right. That's it. Yeah. So, so thank you. I mean, you know, Awari coming, you know, but yeah. a lot of this is also, you know, in these classes where I'm just taking out a note and then pulling, pulling the thread to see what's the origin Come and then on. going, okay, why don't I know this? All right, everyone needs to know. We live in a society where people feel like knowledge, and it is so powerful, has to be kept away from people. And the beauty of this space is that it is, you have democratized, you have made it available to everyone. Now, now everyone's going to take it, you and know, like, like, like the Nubia chat is completely different from the chat in YouTube. Of completely course. different. Of course. But I, mean, I don't want to be provocative. I mean, Look, I, look, as a descendant of those who were captive here, who were descendants of those who were not captive, who were descendant of those who started humanity, those aren't equal times. The, 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 the ADOS pain is real. The FBA way is real. And for those who would make a distinction between them, I don't make a distinction. I don't make a distinction. I understand there are distinctions, but there's no difference because they all retreat to American nationalism in many ways. That's not a critique. 
I'm not being critical. What I'm saying is that it's it's a challenge and it's something that we have to to work our way through because you know we're entering an election season and you know this is just a brief what you've just said is absolutely real. These white nationalists have lost, they've dropped all pretense. In Texas, I mean, in Florida, they, at this point, it's like there are no rules. I mean, like you say, look, Fonnie Willis, in, an, in a governance conversation, we're going to have a different conversation. Maybe we come in Nubia one night and talk about that in terms of how she and, and that office has worked. Same thing with Alvin Bragg in New York. There's a problem. I mean, it doesn't matter what color you are. I mean, you got Wesley Bell. They, they pumping more money than God into him to take out Corey Bush. And, so, and these are two black people. We can have that conversation. But that's a different conversation than okay, you had a tryst with this guy, it's a problem, okay, I quit, we move on. You got this other dude who is your color, who's from Pinpoint, Georgia, who's from Gullah Geechee, who's white wife, and it shouldn't even matter what color she is, she's a whole ass white nationalist, and he don't recuse himself from nothing. What it's revealing is there are no rules. Do y'all understand there are no rules? And some people say, oh, voting doesn't matter. Okay, here's how much it doesn't matter. When you go to Texas, I know was telling me, she and Ken, uh, their son, she got his driver's license, it, it, first of all, they take maybe four or five walk-ins a day at the driver's license offices. They haven't closed. And if you have an appointment and don't have the right document, it might take you up to 90 days to get an appointment. If it didn't matter, why are they making it so hard for you get an ID to go vote? You you don't think it matters? Okay, go try. Oh, we moved to polling place. What the hell? Oh, yeah, it must matter then. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so what you said is true. We are right on the brink. And guess what? This ain't new. We're going back to the 1870s, 80s, and 90s. In fact, we aren't going back. We're already there. We're, we're there. I don't even think we left. <laughs> I don't think we left. I think we never left. You know, um, I, I was like, the Cold Civil War never ended. Never um, ended. And, you know, I, I prefer not to, to name check folk because at the end of the day, it's irrelevant and it becomes a distraction. And then people jump on that and then their people jump on that. And then if we're in a fight when we shouldn't even be fighting about any of this because ain't none of us free here until we, all of us are free here. So what are we doing, really? So I'm not even I'll talk to everybody. Thank you. Thank you know, you. so, you know, no, because we, you. All, we all have to I mean, it, it becomes so personal. That's and then okay. I always ask, what's the purpose? What are, what are we really doing here? You know, you want to be right at what cost? Be exactly. right then. Go be right, you know, while we do the work. Because Dory Ladner closed her eyes, never concerned about being a household name. That's right. But it's our responsibility to make sure she was a household name because the work that she did, we stand on it. Teach. Right? So let's focus on the work. Teach. Focus on the Teach. work. And everybody that's got an opinion, have an opinion. And have wipe it. your butt every day, too, because that's it. <laughs> right alongside your opinion. <laughs> You know what? Thank you. Thank you. No, no, thank you. I, I, we needed to hear that, and that should be the last word. Thank you, because you're right. Clean glasses of water. I apologize. Really. No, no. I mean, it's, it's, it, you know, when folk are coming for you, you know, it, well, we, 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 we wired similarly. Well, I'm, I'm not. We happy. are. We, we I mean, are. I'm in the comments, <laughs> y'all. You people on YouTube, like, I, that, that lady's mean. I can't believe she's talking to me like this. Yeah, it's my house. It's and true. I live here. Okay. No Take your shoes off. You know, <laughs> the door. you know, like we, we're going to have rules of engagement. Yeah. I know you're not used to it. We all yelling in the void because it's, it's social media. I can say what I want. I'm free. Yeah. You're free, but it's my house. I got rules sure. of how we're going to engage. So if you're not up for the conversation no and way. you just want to insult and yell, and squeak, no, 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 you will be, you'll be gathered. And then you'll be, <laughs> this, is, this is it. We got time for all of this back and forth. No, you, you have to you you're right. And, and, and we do have similar spirits. We, we have the same spirit in that regard. And that's why when you said that coming from you, I wanted to say that to you because I know how easy it is for us to be tuning forks. And when we're tuning forks, the greater society, that's why I said I, I feel the pain. I know that pain. We got to, and, and again, Marie Bukowski is right. Let us agree to agree. And good speech, Jay Crosby said. So thank you for saying that because it's it's a gentle reminder Gentle but 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 firm reminder that we got to pour a clean glass of water. That's a that's a that's a whole word, bro. I'm grateful to you for saying it. Right. Yeah. That's, I love you. I, I love, love you too. absolutely. And, and these Maryland farmers. Well, yeah, that's just old. <laughs> Listen, I, 
appreciate it because you know I don't I don't cuss because the way that I talk is already uh <laughs> I know right. people, so I don't cuss, I don't add to it because then right. people be in the corner crying, holding themselves. So but, <laughs> but now you're giving me more language, you know. No, that, that, that's, that's so the 60s. All these old heads in here from the 60s, they remember that's where the uh my Sharik used to kill me, and then this Maryland farmer gonna come up. With, What's a Maryland farmer? Oh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Love it. I All right, love you, dear. Love you too. Love you too. Love everyone. Oh, well, um, I should mention the brother you had on, uh, uh brother Akio Parker. He's, oh. actually, he's actually in town. He's gonna be at San Kofa today at one, talking about all this math. So just to just so you holler know, at him. if you're gonna be there, holler at him because I I want to bring him in. He wants to be yeah. here. So he when, I I've been inundated, so I just have to take a oh, moment. No, 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 no. That's good. You know, Akil been with us. He was in Freedom School 20 years ago. Akil been teaching math in Philly for years. So if you get a chance, if your child has math phobia, if you have math phobia, if you're in DC DMV, come by San Cofa today at one and check out Akil Parker he, with all this math. He's a serious dude and he's a good brother. Yes, so yes, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. See some of y'all in Maroon's Medicine Chest. Monday, Dr. Yeah. David Black is going to be on Urban View with me at three. Uh, all right. Have a good weekend. Love you. See you later.